What's the one thing that lets us soak in the beauty of life? Yet we often overlook vision, the lens through which we see our world. But in today's digital age, are we doing right by our eyes? Enter Dr. Bryce Applebaum, an optometrist wizard with a deep dive into vision development and therapy. And my work is the missing piece that many of my patients never knew they needed. Today, we uncover more than just the biology of sight, because vision, as it turns out, is a transformative tool that shapes our entire experience. Trust me, you don't want to blink and miss this one. The first question is going to seem a little odd, um, but I have a reason for this question, which is, how many years of school have you gone through? I was reading through your bio, and and you've done a lot just school-wise. How many years was that? I've done way, way too much schooling. So undergrad, uh, and then four years of optometry school. And unfortunately for my specialty, they don't really teach any of this in, in school. So there's a separate residency, which is usually a year. And then a fellowship process, which can be done while you're still uh, providing clinical care, but that's about three years. I always like to say that the real learning takes place with, with our patients, where we learn from every patient we're with. We, we learn how to deliver better care, how to challenge status quo, and, and really find the best ways to take science and, and clinical experience and overall experience to really maximize uh, the level of care so that we can get people to unlock life's potential through vision. And that's what really every patient deserves. The reason I asked this question was, I'm going to go out on a limb. Most people won't go through that much schooling unless they have like a deep why. Now, some people will look and they're like, oh, financially, this makes a good decision, is a good decision. But that's a lot of schooling. And I'm going to just guess that there's probably a story behind it, whether it's somebody close to you when you're growing up had vision or eyesight issues, or maybe even you had vision or eyesight issues. Am I, am I missing the mark here? No, no, you're, you're right on the money here. So I really am where I am today in life because of the work that I provide. And, and so for the reason for that, you know, for me, it all started in elementary school, probably around first grade or so. And I have this vivid image in my mind of being on the soccer field. Uh, my team was the purple people eaters at the time. And there was this moment where I was the lone defender. There was these three attackers coming at me on a breakaway. And I remember feeling like it, it's them, it's me, it's this goal behind me and just completely freezing as if my legs were stuck in, in quicksand as these guys blew right past me and easily scored a goal. And I remember feeling lost in space and afraid and helpless, like I had completely just let my teammates down, giving away the goal to the other team. And now at the time, I had these visual developmental delays. So what that meant was I had trouble focusing my eyes and I had poor depth perception and, and my eyes didn't work together as a team, really causing me to freeze in moments where I should have sprung into action. And that evening at the dinner table, I remember a complete breakdown with my parents. Mm. The tears came pouring out and I shared with them I didn't know where to be on the field or what to do. And how in the classroom, I, I was having so much trouble even just seeing what the teacher was writing on the board. Often having to ask my friends, what does that say? Or pretend to go up and sharpen my pencil on those old school pencil sharpeners, if you remember those, uh, to sneak a peek at the board. And I found, you know, even though I was a reluctant reader, I would then fly through other subjects because I was trying to compensate for my deficiencies with how my eyes were working as a unit. And because of my vision had this negative confidence that allowed me to really feel like a turtle retreating to my shell in so many aspects of life. Fortunately, I was born to the perfect parents. My father was a developmental optometrist, my mother an occupational therapist. And it really wasn't until that dinner table conversation that you know, they recognize how severe the situation was and put and really put the pieces together for me, where they really facilitated the appropriate and necessary vision development to allow me to soar in life. So I did vision office based vision therapy, I did sensory integration based occupational therapy, mainly because I had to because I knew to listen to my parents. But because of the consistent nature of, of the treatment I received, Really, everything came together for me a few years later, maybe in about the fourth grade or so, when my eyes, my brain, my body all finally started working together, and this confidence emerged where I became a stud athlete, and I started to, to enjoy reading and even developed 
the interpersonal communication skills needed because I understood my sense of self and space um, to really turn this disability into a strength where I could rely on vision to give me an advantage in life and continue with treatment. Obviously, I've transitioned from patient to clinician now where you know my mission is to change the way that the world is viewing vision, but also to get vision therapy a seat at the medical table so that more people have access to the care that I receive so that so much of life can be enhanced through our, through our dominant sensory system being vision. You keep saying vision. Is that something that's different than eyesight? And then like why were, what is vision therapy and why wasn't it just like, we'll slap some glasses on you? So appreciate you bringing this up. So I, I really look at eyesight and vision as completely separate entities. Eyesight being the ability to see, whether that's letters on a letter chart or street sign or what the teacher writes on the board in the classroom. Eyesight is really just a symptom. Vision is entirely brain and what our brain does with the, with the information that the eye sends it and how our brain tells our eyes how to move together and to converge and to track and focus and process information and really how we derive meaning from the world around us and then direct the appropriate action. So really, we should think of eyesight as just glasses and taking a blurry image and making it clear, vision being far more complex but really being brain. And what most people don't recognize is the vast majority of vision problems are functional in nature and they're treatable and they're avoidable, but it's a functional medicine approach to vision rather than a structural, more reactive approach. This is more of a proactive approach. And something like vision therapy, it, it's, it's almost like physical therapy for the brain through the eyes with the intention of literally rewiring the software of the brain to change how somebody's using vision to establish the vision development that maybe didn't happen naturally on its own, or to rehabilitate the visual brain after, let's say, a head injury or a traumatic brain injury where there's rerouting and adaptations that take place, or even from an enhancement standpoint. You know, we're, there's so much that can be done to optimize our brain's ability to use our eyes together as a team and to really have all the different sensory systems that are important for vision all firing on all cylinders and, and working at their ceiling. Hmm. So you said you could enhance your vision so like you can supercharge or increase the performance of your eyesight or vision? In many cases, yes. I work with a lot of professional athletes, professional teams, college athletes and teams, even amateurs who just want to beat their buddies on the tennis court, let's say. I mean, we're all taught at an early age, or at least told at an early age, to keep your eye on the ball but we're never really taught how. And what we do is mm -hmm. we teach how. We arrange the conditions to raise to someone's awareness what they're doing, how their visual system is functioning and operating so that we can teach them how to self-correct and self-monitor and improve, let's say, visual reaction time or depth perception or peripheral awareness. And you know the, the zone that everybody talks about with sports, let's say, we know visually and neurologically what that means and what systems we're, ta we're tapping into. And we can actually create that and allow somebody to more easily and quickly tap into that heightened level of integration of space to be able to really get an advantage and slow down the sport or prepare your body more efficiently for so many aspects of life. On the same thread, I know a lot of people right now especially like in business world are all about like biohacking and human optimization could this what you're talking about could this help somebody even like perform better in the business world so well especially with screen time being the new pandemic now and all of us staring at screens way more than humans should and way more than our brains can can function with, you know, there's so much stress in life and visual stress. And then our response to that stress is the root cause of so many vision problems. So all of the muscles in our bodies, we can work them out. We can develop better control, better integration. Yet for some reason, people think the eye muscles and the eye brain connection can't be optimized or can't be improved. I mean, that's as silly as that sounds. That's what most eye doctors and most medical professionals preach but it is absolutely not accurate. You know, we, we can improve eye movement control. We can improve the inside and outside muscles of the eyes and, and how they're working in synergy. 
and we can allow the brain to not be taxed or as fatigued as it could or should based off of using these systems efficiently and automatically and unconsciously. So I'm a big biohacker from lots of different areas, but vision should be, you know, top of mind, tip of tongue in terms of what we're doing to allow uh, our, our visual cognition to really open up and our brain's ability to use our eyes be that much more efficient and automatic. If we were to manage our vision, because that's something that uh, that what I'm understanding now is controllable, does that increase the longevity of our eyesight? It really should. Um, for most of us in our mid 40s, let's say, the inside muscles of the eyes, the focusing system, becomes more rigid and less flexible. Mm -hmm. And most people realize they start to hold things farther away. And a lot of eye doctors say, oh, go jump off the deep end and, and grab yourself some readers, which then does the work for you. That becomes your new normal. You mm -hmm. then need something stronger to maintain that same clarity. And we get this vicious cycle with intention, with work, we can establish better flexibility and stamina of that system. And just like we work out our body, we can work out our eyes and work out our, our eyes and brain and how they're working together to at a minimum prolong the need for reading glasses. In most cases, decrease the magnitude or the help that's needed. But then absolutely, you know, if our prescriptions keep increasing throughout the years, there's always a reason why. That's not normal. That's not supposed to happen unless there's a functional problem and we're treating the symptom but then the problem is still there, so then the symptom gets worse. So especially for people whose prescriptions get worse, we can very often slow that down and in many cases even reverse it. But distance eyesight should not decrease as we age uh, unless there's cataracts or other things that, that form in terms of the structure, but a lot can be done to make that a non-issue. But then even near, you know, near does get harder as we age, but uh, cavemen didn't have reading glasses. And yet they still could make sense of what was in front of them and know what they're at least eating and watching what they're eating. So a lot can be done to, to keep what we have for, for a long period of time and even improve what we have for extended periods of time. Mm -hmm. You said potentially even reverse um, some of the eyesight issues. So for me in particular, um, I was a, a production welder for 10 years, production TIG welder. So I spent nine hours a day, five days a week for almost 10 years, welding these little tiny circles, like eight inches, nine inches away from my face, like in this very dark hood, but staring at this very bright light. And eventually that led to glasses. And I noticed that for me, uh, when I couldn't read street signs anymore at night, um, and I was like, man, there's something going on with my eyes here. And so Initially, I was like, oh, I'll just go to the eye doctor, right? And we'll slap some glasses on you. Now, I don't have much of a prescription, like hardly at all. Would there be any potential um, for me to be able to? And, and I actually, um, we can get into screen fit. I'd love to get into that. But is there any potential, like, for me to be able to reverse it and maybe get out of glasses with, like, some intense vision therapy? So not to dive too deep into neurology here, but we've got two main processing systems, one that looks at central information, one that looks at peripheral information. In a normal healthy brain, we're using both of those systems in synergy simultaneously so we can know what's in front of us and around us. Your world got condensed to right in front of you to this really close demand. And in general, when our visual system is under stress, our pupils widen and we get this tunnel vision effect. But for you being collapsed to this position here, your brain then adapted to that. And then this near visual stress caused this distance blur because the system lost flexibility. So far away was blurry, not because your eyes, let's say, changed shape. It was blurry because the muscles themselves likely got fatigued and were adapting to get to right here. That's nearsightedness, and we now have research and literature to support the three main risk factors for nearsightedness developing is prolonged near work, work in the dark at near, and not enough time outside, which is like hitting the nail on the head on all three for you. <laughs> so, so then to then say the far away is the trifecta of terrible. 
A trifecta of terrible. Let's <laughs> let's coin that. So then you went to the doctor and, and you probably said, I can't see stuff as well as I'd like to. And again, 99% of eye doctors will say, okay, your chief complaint is far away is fuzzy. I have a solution to that. I can make far away clear. Here are some glasses. And in some cases that's needed, especially for driving and you know reading street signs and things like that. But if you didn't then change careers and you still have the same visual stress, again, that's going to become your new status quo. You're going to need something stronger, different to maintain that same level of clarity. And then we go down this vicious cycle and prescription increases. So I'm a big believer that prescription wise, we should be in the weakest lens as possible, if at all, it should be the most balanced between each eye. And it sh there should be an improvement in performance in order to then go down that path of, of needing glasses. So assuming that that was in your adult life and we saw changes there and it's a minor prescription, I would say not potential for improvement for you. I would say strong likelihood for improvement with the right motivation, right work, and you know the desire to have that be um, you know, a, a tangible outcome, I would say, without even knowing anything else about what's involved. And obviously, we could do testing and figure all that out. I, I would say that there is a very promising visual future for you down the road. Well, I want to dive into the vision therapy side of things because I know you have a program out there called Screen Fit. And I know this because here at the Life Edge, we vet out online courses and coaches, and I I came across to you, my wife found you, and I was really excited to dig into it because screen fit, I think, applies to everyone this day as far as, or everyone in this day and age, because we spend so much of our time looking at screens as you and I currently are looking at screens to talk to each other. And so I've been going through screen fit. I'm on day 25 of 30. And which is your your vision, essentially your vision therapy. Uh, actually, why don't you just tell us a little bit about screen fit? Sure. So during the pandemic, when we when the life stopped, when life stopped and we were all stuck at home doing God knows what, I remember seeing my three kids with their heads buried in screens and recognizing this is a huge problem, not just for them, but for men and womankind and we got to do something about this. So ScreenFit is a online vision training program designed to reduce symptoms associated with prolonged screen use, establish the right visual skills and abilities to actually support and handle screen use, and also instill mindful habits so that, you know, bad habits don't become embedded. So it, it's a, a program where there's two courses. Each course is 30 lessons. Uh, each lesson should take about 10 to 15 minutes to complete. And really it's a kind of like a do it yourself program. And I relate this to working out. It's kind of like doing body weight exercises at home with sit-ups and air squats and push-ups, but with some ver variability and some variety and keeping it exciting. And obviously way more than that, where as humans, we're not meant to be staring at screens all day yet. So many of us have to, and I think one of the biggest kept secrets in at least my space is we can develop the foundation to thrive in this digital world, but most of us don't have the ability to do that naturally and it has to be artificially taught. And so screen fit is a way to really establish that foundation. Um, the youngest person that has gone through it has been five years old. The oldest has been 89. And so far, literally every single person who's gone through this has seen a reduction in symptoms. And we now have this as, um, a uh, some an offering for many different corporations from a wellness standpoint from different hr departments um there's even a government agency that's going to be employing this so this is has exceeded all my expectations because it's essentially what i do in my practice on a daily basis but almost like a a vision therapy light and one where we've carefully sequenced the learning and had lots of different uh, experiments and beta test studies done where not really anyone's symptoms can get worse, but the normal symptoms we all experience like headaches and eye strain and double vision and fatigue and decreased productivity and neck and back pain and dryness and irritation. And the list literally goes on and on and on at a minimum, there should be a pretty substantial reduction for the vast majority of people uh, who experience those symptoms and go through the screen fit program.
Now for me, I like I said, I'm 25 days into the program. I've been doing it daily now. Um, and some of that's how I wanted to, to go through the program, check it out, and make sure what you guys are providing is a value, which it, it is. 100% you are getting more than you paid for. And the reason I, want, I say that is because for me in particular, I because I spend so much time working on screens that I, at the, by the end of the week, my eyes physically hurt. Like there's some significant eye strain going on and I get these terrible, terrible tension headaches by the end of the day, Friday from just sitting in a chair, staring at a computer. And since literally since I started screen fit on a Monday, so it was at the beginning of my week, my work week, and I have yet to have that similar, those similar eye strains. I've yet to have the tension headaches at the end where it's like, and now I'm looking for ibuprofen or a Tylenol or something just to kind of help chill things out so I can relax. And I, it, the only thing I've changed throughout these last 25 days, I've actually increased stressors in life, but the, I've just incre- I've added screen fit in the program that you've developed into my life. And from that, I have I don't get the double vision anymore, so I used to get double vision really bad at the end of the day. Most days I would have double vision with glasses. <laughs> I don't get the headaches, and um, I don't get the tension anymore. And so it's been, for me personally, I know that my vision is valuable to me because I don't want to live in this fantastic world without being able to see. And th- there isn't... There isn't anything I wouldn't pay to be able to continue to see. So, like, for me, the value of the course is phenomenal. Chris, I so appreciate you sharing that and so happy that you had the opportunity to go through this. And honestly, that you did this before we even spoke because I didn't I didn't know any of this. And think about how many people like you are are struggling and straining and not even having an end in sight or even knowing there's a solution out there. Um, but that's, that's fantastic. And, you know, you put in the work, you, you did, you did, mm. did exercises, you, um, hopefully went all in with what you're doing and, and you're not even half done with, with what we have out there, but even just, you know, you mentioned reaching for medication and, you know, the amount of people I see that are going to the doctor and saying, what the heck is wrong with me? And then there's testing run and MRIs. And, and if you think about the, the reach this has in terms of, avoiding unnecessary testing in the medical system and unnecessary medications, but then also opening up your visual world so that you can actually be productive and be happy and spend the time that you want devoted to your business and to your passions and then have the time to be with your family without symptoms afterwards. That's fantastic. I'm, I'm so happy for you. Yeah, I'm actually really excited um, to have my wife start it here shortly, being that she's a dental hygienist. She's under a lot of that with her loops and everything. She's under a lot of that like right here, similar strain that I had as a welder. And so she's not, thank goodness, she's not in glasses. Um, She still has really good vision, but I want to, I know she does deal with a lot of strain by the end of the week. Um, Same style, even though she's not staring at a screen, she's still... Um, in people's mouths in that very tight location under a bright light where so seems very similar to me and the welding so I'm it's going to be really exciting to see how the impacts that that um, screen fit has on her and uh, moving forwards but one thing I was really interested in going through the program was some of the focus on the peripheral and how much does that play a part in our everyday vision? Because it wasn't something I even considered until going through the ScreenFit program. So from a, a training standpoint and a rehabilitation standpoint, periphery is the key to everything centrally. And you know, for you and your wife having your world be so confined to up close, you know, I think getting us away from screens, but also the, getting us to a place where we can take in those two processing pathways like we spoke about at the same time, mm-hmm. opening up periphery decreases the stress response visually and allows us to get us so much of a better understanding of where things are located in space, where we are in relation to those other systems, but it honestly allows the inside and outside muscles of the eyes to be in such a better marriage together 
so that these maladaptations or bad habits don't become embedded. And, you know, when we're under stress in general, we have two options, avoid or adapt. You know, everything you're describing, these are maladaptations. And the vast majority of people in glasses, those are maladaptations. But you also, you don't need to have glasses to have a vision problem. In fact, the vast majority of people in my office don't even have glasses, and it's more eyes not working well together as a team, or uh, the brain's ignoring it, but form the eyes unconsciously and they don't even know about it, or there's trouble tracking their eyes or focusing their eyes, or they even have a lazy eye that has emerged so that the brain doesn't have to use both eyes together. You know, we're all born without our functional visual skills in place, and then through our life experiences, we develop them and we acquire them. So that's either learn well or not learn as well as it could be, and that's when some intervention is needed. But something like screen fit is literally stepping in, drawing a line in the sand, and then rerouting vision development, even if these changes have occurred recently in the last couple of years when you know screens have been catapulted into the workplace and the classroom and learning and everything, where, again, most humans are not visually ready for that scenario, and that's when the symptoms emerge. I heard, I think it was on another podcast I was listening to you about or on your Instagram, I think you had mentioned like sometimes even these vision problems get diagnosed as things like ADHD and other things. Um, how How is anyone supposed to know the difference with the, the world we live in today? Yeah, I mean, there, there are so many misdiagnoses and missed opportunities when it comes to vision. You know, so many vision problems mimic other labels. And you bring up ADD, ADHD, even dyslexia, those are incomplete diagnoses unless functional vision problems are ruled out first. So somebody who has trouble attending visually or attending in general, you know, if they if you prefer to be read to or rely on audiobooks rather than reading on your own, that's a pretty clear sign that at a minimum there's probably something going on visually. Mm -hmm. Or a smart child who's not achieving or living up to their potential, clear sign. Or somebody who's really squirmy with sustained near concentration tasks but can maintain attention and focus on other things. You know, it's not like there's a blood test you can take to say, oh, yeah, you have ADD or ADHD. It's based off of symptoms and it's based off of behaviors. And more than half of those symptoms and behaviors are the exact same ones with a certain, with several functional vision problems like convergence insufficiency, where if it's hard to maintain visual attention, it's of course going to be that much harder to maintain cognitive attention compared to if that's not the case. And, you know, really, we could talk about screening tests, we could talk about screening uh, symptom checklists even, but vision problems are everywhere. And when you know what to look for, then they're right in front of your face. So somebody has trouble catching a ball or uses reading as a sleeping pill or is motion sick or, um, you know, has never really found happiness or enjoyment with reading and they're kind of even avoiding it whenever possible. To me, those are clear signs, almost clearer than even doing the testing to say, yeah, there's probably some sort of eye coordination problem in place. And obviously the testing uh, supports that and then lets us know exactly at what level and what the treatment should be. I, I, I distracted myself with my own interest uh, on there on that question. I wanted didn't want to leave a screen fit quite yet, but uh, what uh, what was interesting um, just to transition back into screen fit is you had mentioned earlier that it's like the fitness program for your eyes, and as I'm going through it and I'm doing the different prescribed movements and things that you that you placed in the program, that's honestly exactly what it felt like, and and how I had to approach it was in order to stay through it was like, um, because it's not that long and none of the, none of the movements or anything are difficult, but you have to stay disciplined because I want good vision. I don't want to be blind. I, I want to be able to see, and I don't want headaches at the end of the day. And so I was like, I'm going to stick through this. And the way you have the program set up where you do an activity one day and then you time it or you're, you're actually tracking the data to see the, and the improvement that you had from literally one day to the next by just doing this movement for two minutes. And then the next day I do it again and it's significantly faster. It's significantly easier. There's less strain on my eyes. Like my eyes literally improved, especially with some of the focus um, based ones where you're focusing near and far. There's so many different things 
that you don't consider because you feel like you're doing these things regularly all day long, but you're really not. Like I spend most of my day inside of rooms, small rooms. I'm not looking beyond 10, 15 feet. And most like of the majority of that day, I spend staring at a screen that's anywhere from 10 to 18 inches away from my face. And so it was really interesting seeing the improvement and especially on some of the the, the near to far focusing um, uh, practices, that was a stretch for my eyes going through that. And it was, my eyes were like, hey, we're not used to this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a program where you have to put in the time, you got to do the work. And somebody saying, fix this for me, screen fits not for you. But somebody saying, oh my gosh, there's something I can do to get my eyes to work more efficiently together and to be able to stare at screens with more productivity and you know, not feel like by the end of the day I want to rip my eyes out. I mean, that's, that, that's what this is for here. Um, but yeah, it, it, we're, we really attempted to create the situations in life where we're using our visual system with a training program so that we can really get dial in the exact visual skills and abilities needed to support the active life that most of us live mm. and living an active life, but then being sedentary on a screen, you know, th there's so many challenges that come with that. This is kind of low hanging fruit to just be able to have more enjoyment and be more productive with what we're asking of ourselves on the screen. Mm -hmm. Who would you say like this program is ideal for? So although Literally, any every single person would benefit from this. I, I would say, kind of the avatar is is thirty five to fifty five year olds, where you know w w the, there's that much greater demand, that much greater need for screen engagement. We start to see those anatomical changes we spoke about that occur, you know, in our forties or so, and it's that much easier to notice improvement when up close is starting to get blurry and you're starting to get these headaches and you're starting to sit farther back. To be able to tangibly see the changes, that's enough for most people to kind of dangle a carrot in front of them to say, oh my gosh, my hard work is paying off because mm -hmm. obviously symptoms are important and that's why you do this. But then we're gathering a lot of data from this as well so that we can even even further fine tune what we're doing and, and make changes um, you know, to maximize every second that we have with somebody's uh, desire and, and, and motivation to make life, life changing results. I've got to imagine that this isn't, may not be, you're probably turning heads in the optometry world, or at least ruffling some feathers because you're, you're moving away from, well, continue coming back to me to get your prescription changed, which is, which is a great business model for a doctor to, no, we can we can prolong your vision and and help you avoid having to do any of this for a long time. Yeah, I uh, Chris, I've got targets on my back and they're only increasing. And truthfully, pre COVID, I, I was in that same camp and I thought if I couldn't help somebody a hundred percent, I don't want to work with them. And in my offices, I'm very selective with who we put in office based vision vision therapy and we want a hundred percent success rate. And it's really complicated. And then. I've recognized that helping somebody 20, 30, 50, 90% is still helping somebody. And there are so many people who are out there struggling unnecessarily because of these hidden or misdiagnosed vision problems that I don't care that I'm ruffling feathers. And that kind of lets me know I'm doing I'm, what I'm doing is, is the right thing to be doing because, you know, the more stories we hear of people who had life changing results from doing this online vision training program, the more it kind of fuels my fire and and, rec and allows me to recognize I can't wait for the next programs for concussion and brain injury rehab and for helping facilitate reading development for, for kids and people who haven't developed the ability to read or even programs for you know sports vision enhancement to be able to optimize uh, small percentages in lots of areas to really improve performance and allow somebody's to, to maximize uh, their athletic ability and, and achieve their true potential. That that's, it blows my mind too, that you could help that vision therapy can help with something like um, concussions and trauma, head trauma, or even some of the, it makes sense a lot with some of the learning development. Um, but 
I, the mind is a, a, an amazing thing. The brain is an amazing thing. And so the connection to vision and healing your brain, it just blows my mind. And if you think about vision being represented in every lobe of our brain, remember, not eyesight, vision, and the fact that there are more areas of our brain dedicated to processing vision than all of our other senses combined, it's almost impossible to have a head injury and not have vision be impacted. It's just a matter of at what level. And when that happens, the so much of life changes. And there's this sensory overload that occurs in places with crowded environments like malls or grocery stores or, or screens start to elicit dizziness and blurry vision and, and nausea. And, and I'm a big believer that with the right work, almost every concussion can return to previous level of function and return to screens and reading. It just, you got to do the right work. And about 50 to 60% of my practice now is concussion brain injury rehab, and that's only increasing because we're now recognizing in the medical world how much more we need to learn about head injury, but how much we actually do know. And, you know, the fact that that perceptual connection with the world gets disrupted, we can literally teach people how to use their eyes to retrain their brain to get back to where they were. Hmm. Do you have a success story you could share with us? Uh, absolutely. For, for a head injury, for uh, kids going from reluctant readers to avid readers, for athletes, what, what do you think would be the most, most oh, interesting? I'm really interested in this head injury. Yeah. Um, I, I would say myself, I had a massive one, and, and that really brought me back to life uh, pretty amazingly. But I would say in general that the one that comes to mind, there was this patient named Lisa who was a – uh, a middle elementary school teacher and she had somebody throw a toy at her It hit her in the head and she thought nothing of it but then all of a sudden these headaches and this dizziness and this nausea and disrupted sleep and light sensitivity and she went to all these doctors and they said everything's fine testing comes up normal yet she literally couldn't look at a screen without wanting to throw up she couldn't be in the classroom without wanting to retreat and fortunately, one of the parents of her students uh, had worked with us and said, go see this weird eye doctor, Dr. Applebaum, and, and see if there's anything that can be done to help. I know he's helping a lot of people with head injuries. And turns out she was like to a T, had the profile of exactly our avatar for head injury and, and the visual profile that emerges from that. Um, we worked with her. We, we Our therapy is office based, but we do a lot of home reinforcements. We put a big emphasis on, on homework essentially so that more repetition allows for faster changes and faster results. And for her, I think she was done in probably three and a half, four months or so, but got back to the place where she could handle the lesson planning that was needed for her classroom. Mm -hmm. She could handle juggling what felt like a million kids running around all the time. She got off, she was getting Botox injections for her headaches. She got off the Botox injections. Rather than having the brain uh, suppress feeling with medication, she actually got her brain to be reorganized and established a lot, a lot more order from the disordered world that she was experiencing um, and even got rid of her glasses, which were prescribed by an eye doctor that said, well, your focusing system's not working right. Here's glasses that does it for you. And those became a crutch for her. I um, actually saw her for a follow-up earlier this week. And so that, she comes to mind because she talks about where the heck w would I have been had we not put in this work and was having a lot of mental health challenges and depression and some anxiety. And, you know, to me that showed that she cared and that she knew that this wasn't normal, yet the medical system couldn't find anything wrong because they didn't know what testing to do and they couldn't figure out – what was occurring because, you know, from a imaging standpoint, this is all at such a microcellular level, you need a functional MRI or a spec scan, something that's looking at brain activity to actually see the disrupted areas and then more importantly know how to put the pieces back together. That's pretty amazing. And it's it's I'm so excited and happy to talk to people like you who are like, we are going to start looking at root causes. And I know that Holistic approaches to things generally get a bad rap and people think it's voodoo medicine or whatever, but the proof is right there. <laughs> you just proofs in the pudding. And honestly, the vast majority of vision problems are functional in nature and need to be addressed from a holistic basis. You know, we integrate cognition and movement and balance and vestibular input 
into all the work that we do because vision doesn't operate in isolation of, of those other systems. Mm -hmm. And we now have health coaches working with a lot of our brain injury patients to make sure the brain has the right supplementation to fire on all cylinders. We have the right nutrition to give us the instructions on how to function and we have the right lifestyle modifications so that the infl inflammatory action that occurs within us that is some often just kind of laying dormant can get to a place where it is supported and vision is supporting it so that we can unlock so much of what's holding us back in life. And, and a lot of us may not even realize it. Like one thing that ScreenFit opened up for me was my hand-eye coordination was terrible. You have different, um, different uh, modules where you're, you're doing these hand-eye coordination movements to, to, to improve it. And I was all over the map to the point where I revisited those, those um, trainings more than once just because I was like, I need more improvement in this area right now. Um, so yeah, it was, it was amazing. That's great um, to hear. And, and there's, you know, the, how vision guides movement is so huge for so many aspects of life, but especially that eye hand, eye brain, and even just right eye, left eye coordination that's needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Dr. Bryce, it has been amazing having you here as we start to wrap up. There's one question I love to ask all my guests, and that is one lesson. What is one lesson that you've learned in life that you want to share with all the listeners? Well, I love that, especially with the name of your podcast here. So I would say to me, it's, it's putting your vision first. You know, if you have a headache, maybe you go to the neurologist or if you or your child is squirmy in the classroom or with sustained desk work, maybe you go to a psychiatrist or a learning specialist, or if you're motion sick, maybe an ENT or otolaryngologist. But with almost any symptom, we really need to consider that vision at a minimum could be part of the problem. And so that's why I always advocate putting our vision first, having that go way beyond just going to your eye doctor to see if you need glasses and, and why I've even created uh, a new brand for my practice and everything I'm doing called Vision First with my website, My Vision First, because unfortunately we need to all be advocating for our vision in ourselves because so often healthcare doesn't know what to look for or, or what to do with vision. And so uh, to me, that's the life lesson I learned and that I try and really empower all, all my patients and anyone I come across um, that, that vision is a big piece to so many puzzles. Where can the listener go to find you? Myvisionfirst.com is our new website. It's, ha it's housing a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Um, and then social media. I have uh, an Instagram account, Dr. Bryce Applebaum. Uh, but we spell Applebaum very strangely, A-P-P-E-L, not, not L-E like the apple. My, my ancestors wanted to make things complicated for everybody. <laughs> uh, but those are probably the two best places. And then, of course, ScreenFit.com is a great place to learn more about the program. Um, but I know anyone listening here is going to have a coupon code or, you know, that we can type in to get a discount and, um, really want to be standing on a rooftop blasting how important it is for us to look at our vision and, and screen fits a great solution to help us get there. Awesome. Yes. For anyone listening, I will put all the links down below in the show notes. And we do, Dr. Bryce has given us a amazing 10% off discount code that we can offer you. So check out the, the links down below. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to like subscribe and, and share it with your friends. And if you're listening on uh, Apple or Spotify, please rate and review. But Dr. Bryce, thank you so much for your time today. I can't say thank you enough. I love what you're doing. And I want to continue um, telling people about ScreenFit and this, this new understanding of vision that I have. So thank you. Appreciate that, Chris. And, and, and love the, uh, the podcast and the avenue that you put out there because you are helping so many people by recognizing there's so much we can all do to live a better life. So appreciate you, my man. And thank you for the love. Yeah, thank you, and have a great day. You too.